content is brought to you by Algorand, which is the official sponsor of the Thinking Crypto channel and podcast. Algorand is building the technology to power the future of finance. The convergence of traditional and decentralized models into a unified system that is inclusive, frictionless, and secure. It is founded by Turing award-winning cryptographer Silvio McCalley. Algorand has developed a blockchain infrastructure that offers the interoperability and capacity to handle the volume of transactions needed for DeFi, financial institutions, and governments to smoothly transition into future five. The technology of choice for more than 700 global organizations, Algorand is enabling the simple creation of next generation financial products, protocols, and exchange of value. For more information, please visit algorand.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Ryan Selkis, who is the founder and CEO of Misari. Ryan, great to have you on the show. Good to see you, man. Thanks for having me. Well, Ryan, as mentioned before we started recording, I wanted to speak with you for a long time because I'm very curious about what Misari is doing. Um, we share similar sentiments about crypto and, and the SEC and things along those lines. But before we get there, tell us where you're from. Uh, where'd you grow up? Uh, sure. So I won't give uh, give up all of my uh, OPSEC and, and, you know, uh, and, and prehistory. Uh, to the T, but um, I grew up uh, in New England and I went to school uh, in Boston. Um, stayed in Boston for about ten years uh, between school and 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 kind of post grad, and then um, uh, ended up getting full time into the industry back in 2013. Uh, was an independent analyst uh, up there for a bit, and then uh, moved down to New York when I joined the early team at Digital Currency Group uh, back in 2014. So. Uh, have uh, basically been uh, operating in New York ever since, and um, and you know I've, I've done a few things in between, but um, East Coast by uh, by by birth and uh, and and growing up and 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 all the way to the present day. And when did you first discover Bitcoin? Um, did someone tell you about it? Did you read about it on a forum? And also, what are you holding your crypto portfolio? So I, uh, I first learned about it back in 2011 uh, during something uh, called the debt sequester. Um, and a lot of folks within crypto might not even remember that, but this is basically the first time the U.S. debt was downgraded because of the political gridlock in D.C. and their failure to pass a budget uh, resolution and, and uh, actually come up with some common sense um, spending proposals for, um, uh, you know, for, for keeping the government going. So th this was around... Um, uh, the debt ceiling debate, and, and it was one of kind of the early versions of that post-financial crisis. Um, and when the U.S. debt was downgraded, I started looking into gold uh, quite a bit more. And that's when I first learned about Bitcoin. At the time, um, the only way that you could have been correct with the thesis, but wrong financially, was to short treasuries, buy gold, and ignore Bitcoin. Uh, and of course, that's what I did. Uh, but uh, a couple of years later, uh, it came back around once Fred Wilson had invested in Coinbase and the Winklevoss twins um, introduced their ETF proposal. Um, they shut down Silk Road uh, that fall. And, and, and at that point, I was pretty hook, line and sinker. So, so I'd say full time since mid 2013 and then um, have had a few different operating roles in the meantime. And, uh, you know, as far as it, it sounds like you have Bitcoin in your portfolio, do you have any altcoins or NFTs? Yeah, so I actually uh, disclosed this in uh, my annual report uh, just uh, uh, last month. But my um, my my portfolio is pretty boring. Um, Bitcoin and, and Ethereum predominantly. Uh, Luna, I think, is is uh, actually my second largest uh, holding. But a lot of that is not necessarily a recommendation. It's just a reflection of the fact that it, it went up by about two hundred x in the last um, eighteen months. So. Um, I think, uh, you know, I tend to spend more of my time on um, angel investing and, and you know, strategic investing that might be relevant for Masari. Um, so a lot of infrastructure businesses on the NFT, DAO, DeFi side of things um, uh, are, are probably kind of the other you know, part of the barbell of that portfolio. But I, uh, I don't spend too much time day trading because I've got a day job. Sure. So speaking of day job, you know, you, you were at Coindesk, you were at a DCG. 
And how did the idea of starting Masari come about? And if you can tell us about Masari and the services that you provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I was running CoinDesk in mid, uh, from, from January 2016 through mid 2017, uh, got the business turned around after the last bear market. And um, this was during the kind of euphoria of uh, ICO uh, mania in, in you know, 2017. And um, I ended up uh, getting together with my co-founder, Dan, who I'd worked with previously. Um, we'd invested in his previous company at, at DCG. And he showed me a site that he was working on called OnChain FX. I immediately called him up and had a bunch of ideas for how we could and should work together. And we ultimately aligned on building a registrar of sorts for the booming ICO market. And in particular, we're gonna be focused on disclosures and ongoing updates for all these new projects because they, most of them were pre-launch or pre-utility. Our general thrust was we could build an open data library that would serve almost like an Edgar type database, um, disclosures database for, for this universe of assets. And then something like on-chain effects and other kind of paid tools would ultimately be the for-profit market intelligence subscription as a service, you know, business that would, would ultimately build on that open data set. So Masari was born and, and we got to work on uh, not only aggregating information on, on assets, but developing some of the tools that would help investors or other long-term participants make sense of crypto as an asset class, not just Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and the couple that were available in the beginning of that year. Right. Um, and certainly data and analytics mm -hmm. and, and the ability to track different trends and data mine uh, these different things that are happening in the market. I'm assuming you have uh, a lot of institutional investors uh, who are subscribing to Masari's uh, subscriptions of, of uh, reports and things like that. Yep. More every day. We just had a record sale this morning. So, Oh, wow. Congrats. <laughs> um, without giving names, can you, can you tell us what type of institutions? Really it's any institution that has long-term information requirements uh, that are, are ultimately going to support their listing or participation decisions. And what I mean by that is, yes, we have some fun customers, but they're not necessarily day traders. Some of them are. Many of them can be long-term venture-oriented investors, groups that are, are looking to actively participate in the governance of some of these ecosystems. Um, and of course, you know, I think traders find utility in a variety of, of market intelligence services. Um, but we also cater to large institutions uh, crypto institutions, I'd say, like the big exchanges, wallets, uh, custodians, et cetera, staking services, and uh, new entrants from, from the legacy world that are really just trying to grapple with this from a compliance standpoint. So mm -hmm. some of the uh, research that we are, are able to provide gives a good historical snapshot into uh, how a project has come to market, you know, how it works, what the token economics are. And then we also have an alerting uh, tool called Intel, which you can think about almost like a corporate actions framework, uh, pushing updates on software releases, uh, critical vulnerabilities, changes in token economics, large sales, uh, you know, basically things that you'd expect to see in a disclosure statement for a public company. We automate and, and you know, we provide alerting infrastructure for so that it's easier for teams at these big enterprises that are supporting multiple assets to triage updates. Some of them might go to legal, some of them might go to product or security engineering, um, but we we abstract all that away and, and at the very least serve as a redundancy, but but for the most part, serve as part of the workflows of, of some of these enterprises. Now, I read um, not too long ago about Masari governance. Can you tell us about that product? So, yeah, so governor is uh, kind of an extension of that Intel product where we're going deep on 50 assets now in their communities. Uh, the, the governance process from initial proposal, temperature check, snapshot vote, which is an off-chain uh, signal for uh, whether a community is, is going to adopt a given proposal, all the way through to on-chain execution. And before governor, there was no single place that you could go to track a, uh, a DAO proposal from inception and kind of community conversation all the way through to on-chain execution and implementation. Um, to governors, you know, the, the MVP for that new product was essentially giving people um, 
a, uh, a, a full lay of the land for where proposals were. And as we you know, continue to scale that up, we're going to be adding uh, obviously new assets, new frameworks, but then also additional decision support tools that make it easier for people to proxy their tokens um, or you know, kind of nominate um, different representative individuals that could serve on you know, either committees or subcommittees, almost like you would in a corporate structure between a board of directors with an, you know, an audit committee. In this case, it might be technical oversights, uh, grants program committee, things like that. Um, and, and I think basically what we're, what we're really trying to build there is the connective tissue for decentralized organizations uh, and, and build some of the software that's going to help manage these decentralized communities uh, as efficiently as you might be able to you know, leverage traditional SaaS tools to uh, manage your, your you know, internal ERP system or, uh, or, or you know, HR system uh, at a big company. Got it. And I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see uh, you guys did a funding round, I think it was about $21 million. Can you tell us about who participated and how those funds will be used? Sure. Um, well, mostly it's for scaling, uh, as you can imagine. We, we along with uh, many other teams, had a, a really big year last year and, and a lot of good early momentum so far this year. Um, Point72 led that round. Uh, they're a phenomenal fintech investor that's that's making you know, big um, splashes and, and a big entry uh, into the crypto markets. Uh, I think they're one of the most credible um, uh partners for you know, bringing a startup to legacy financial institutions. Um, and, uh, and they've been you know, a, a terrific partner in that regard. On the other hand, we had pretty much a who's who of, uh, of strategic investors uh, across the, uh, the crypto institutional landscape, if you will. So everyone from you know, Coinbase, Kraken, Gemini, blockchain.com, uh, Alameda, Essentially, every single major custodian and uh, exchange operating out of the West was, was a participant in this last round. And, and so we, um, we were happy to uh, see that and, and, and have that because uh, obviously many of the tools that we're building are going to require broad buy-in and, and participation from some of these big players. So there's been, uh, I've been seeing on Twitter, uh, look, a lot of the XRP army folks are very uh, passionate <laughs> about certain things and everything that's going on with Ripple and SEC. And, you know, they they found that Masari was helping the SEC to build out a, a, some aspect of their Edgar, Edgar system. Now, I understand that from a business standpoint. Um, maybe you can give some clarity there because they're trying to say that, you know, you're a Benedict Arnold or something like that. Uh, you know, things along those lines. I mean, to be honest, I've blocked so many people from, from the XRP community that I, I haven't even really seen it because um, I don't even know how many of those folks are real. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's it's not even really worth discussing. I mean, you know, any anyone uh, that thinks that I am a fan of the leadership of this uh, SEC uh, has not been paying attention and isn't really worth addressing. I'll just leave it at that. My, my Twitter... And my annual report uh, speaks for itself uh, in terms of how I feel about the current SEC. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm not a fan of Ripple either. So I think that's why they're, you know, uh, they're, they're all over me. Well, we'll talk a bit more about that later because I want to get, you know, there's, there's been a history of, you know, with you and, and, and that community and Ripple and so forth. Um, but before we get there, tell us about you know, what data stood out to you for 2021 and what you guys are data mining and what you've seen on your end with regards to the crypto industry? So what stood out as key trends or, or what were some of the, um, what were some of the big trends yeah. in crypto data? Yeah, I, I would say the big trends, like what, what were some of the highlights? Uh, well, I mean, that, that's extremely broad. I think, you know, one of the big things, um, the rotation last year from uh, layer one blockchains complementary or, or competitive with Ethereum, and then the, uh, the kind of macro acceleration of the, the Bitcoin thesis, the you know, big boom that we had over the summer in NFTs, and then towards the back half of the year, the um, excitement around gaming and, and, and metaverse assets and then you know, web, other Web3 assets um, associated with things like file storage or uh, 
decentralized social media, things like that. I mean, there, there was a ton of different thematic winners um, from quarter to quarter and, and it you know, basically just kept rotating. So um, it's hard to pick any one theme. It, it, it kind of felt like last year was the year that all the different building blocks for Web3 between currencies, the smart contract platforms and infrastructure supporting these ledgers, NFTs, DAOs, DeFi, they all took off. Uh, and, um, and, and I think we're here to stay. So I'm, I'm extremely excited about this year. I think, um, the sky's the limit and, and really the only, uh, real governor that we have on the golf cart is, uh, is what happens in the macro environment. Yeah, for sure. Um, what's on the roadmap for Masari? You know, I, I know there's probably certain things you can disclose, but anything you can give a hint on as far as what you guys are planning to execute on this year? Yeah, I mean, we're going to be uh, scraping a ton of on-chain data uh, and, and elevating that into the product across the product suite. We've also got um, a, a tremendous amount of work to do on this governor product, uh, which is going to be one of the kind of foundational pillars that we build the, the future of the company around. Um, I think, you know, our, our general 10-year thesis is that DAOs are going to replace a, a lot of companies and a lot of NGOs and, and, and potentially even some government functions. The question is... Um, how do you build information products and decision products and voting products that actually bring that vision vision to fruition and help people effectively manage uh, in a decentralized way? Because the one thing that we do know is this is not going to scale if every single micro decision is essentially a proxy vote that requires 51% of your users to, to opine on every single little minute issue. People just don't care. They don't have the attention span and, and, and they don't really have the aptitude to... Um, uh, to weigh in if they're not you know close to the issue. So I think a lot of what we're we're thinking about now is how do you build you know delegation tools, decision support tools for those that are actually in the trenches so that you know you can um, have a more fluid decentralized org chart, but still empower individuals or more likely you know pods of individuals, whether they're companies or kind of collectives that come together in an anonymous way to um to actually perform certain services and and you know and build, right? And and uh, and operate effectively, almost like a um, the Hollywood model of work, right? Where you'll have uh, actors and directors and screenwriters and and you know, the crews um, assemble and disassemble for different deliverables. But generally speaking, their reputation persists, and, and they're able to um, uh, ultimately you know get hired and 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 you know, consistently be uh, employed a, a across different projects. Got it. Uh, well, that's exciting. And uh, congrats again. And you mentioned, you know, you guys signed your uh, to date largest client. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, let's talk about the crypto market as a whole. Uh, I want to get your thoughts, given that, you know, you're an OG, you've been here a long time, uh, Bitcoin's growth and adoption. And, you know, we're seeing companies putting Bitcoin in a balance sheet. We're seeing countries making Bitcoin a legal tender more uh, hedge funds, billionaires and so forth are now jumping in due to inflation. You know, what's your thought macro level on, on what's been happening with Bitcoin? I don't think the trend is going to slow. Um, I think it's still maybe underappreciated how bullish the shutdown uh, of Chinese mining was last spring. It, it, cre it created some near-term headache, but I think a lot of long-term tailwinds. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, it reduced the geopolitical risk of, of so much capacity being you know, behind the great fire, firewall. And two, it ultimately allowed us to have a, a conversation about how uh, Bitcoin mining could become greener over time, right? So it's not a panacea right now, but I think the ESG narrative was highly negative going into Q2 of last year. Um, now we have an opportunity to reverse some of that because you in the West, you can control some of that expenditure and, and, and make the case um, for, for you know, how um, Bitcoin can be used to uh, make dirty energy cleaner uh, or actually accelerate the development of, of different clean energy sources. Um, you couldn't really say that with a straight face um, as long as China was in the picture because so much of it was um, driven by coal mining, um, sorry, coal energy uh, and uh, during, during the... Um, uh, certain seasons uh, when when hydro was not really available and widely accessible. So I think, um, 
you know, in a, a 6% inflation uh, environment, uh, in a world where uh, every single central bank is debasing, you know, their currencies and, and printing like crazy, and, um, and we're not, you know, kind of out of the COVID woods yet, I think um, that's going to be a, a strong backdrop for, for Bitcoin and for gold, but more so for Bitcoin, if you think about it as a, a substitute and ultimate replacement um, for physical gold. Now, I kind of have this thesis or theory of there was, it, it, I, I don't know, but but I was talking about it for a while. You talk about the geopolitical battle and, and even when Trump was president that the United States was not going to allow China to control the hash rate. And it seems that while they haven't made it publicly that come, come, come to the United States, they're allowing it. You know, Powell said they're not going to ban Bitcoin or, or crypto. And now there's a Bitcoin mining boom in the United States. The, the largest in North America is in Texas. Um, do you think that given that politicians are holding Bitcoin and institutions are holding Bitcoin, the United States wants Bitcoin to do well and wants to control that hash rate from a global superpower competitive standpoint? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't think that it's necessarily smart for um, uh, or, or a sensible goal for any one country to make it their goal to dominate uh, Bitcoin mining. Mm -hmm. um, regardless, it might not even be possible, right? It's not, um, it's not a network that you can uh, conduct a, a hostile takeover for uh, because it's, it's an arms race by definition, given how the, the difficulty adjustment works. So uh, I think we would be smart as a country to not push that up offshore and overseas, but um, you know, it remains to be seen you know, where, where the ultimate um, capacity splits. Got it. Um, now, Bitcoin is in a corrective phase. Do you believe this bull run is over? And if not, do you have a price prediction for 2022? I don't do price predictions. So they're going to be a lot higher or <laughs> slightly lower? What? The, the, the founder of Masari does not have an accurate price prediction? I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, do you, but, but do you think this this is uh, over, or or do you think it's we're, we're kind of cooling off, uh, and and then maybe we'll have another run up sometime this year? Um, you know, I, I think it's always hard to say. We obviously had a, a tremendous uh, twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one. So at, at some point, you know, trends reverse. We've seen we've been through the cycle multiple times. I certainly don't feel uh, like it's an exuberant environment right now. We haven't had a, a real blow off top. So it, it would be surprising to me if we didn't have a blow off top before another kind of steep bear market. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself at rhyme. So uh, again, I, I don't, I also don't think that we've ever had a macro backdrop that was as um, unclear as the one that we do today. And, uh, and the truth is, crypto has never existed during a uh, global recession. It was born during the last global recession, but, it, but you know, many people, um, you know, there's a whole generation of investors and, uh, and, and financial professionals that have never actually lived through a recession uh, because it's just been a straight recovery since, since they got out of school. So um, I'm not sure. Uh, which, which direction it breaks? I would be, uh, I'd certainly be disappointed for for you know many reasons uh, if we if we dip because I think that this is a um, a golden opportunity and and you know kind of perfect backdrop for crypto thematically and and, and as a thesis for sure. Um, what are your thoughts on Ethereum? Um, obviously, the second largest crypto, um, and it's look. I, Ethereum has a first mover advantage. It's getting a lot of adoptions. NFTs leading it's leading the DeFi movement, but has some scaling issues. Um, are you confident that you know they'll they'll be able to fix that? And we see a lot of competitors entering the market like Solano and Avalanche and so forth. Um, I I really think uh, it's not winner take all anymore. Mm -hmm. fees were high enough on Ethereum for long enough that other alternatives emerged. And now you're starting to see um, other ecosystems develop. The, the question is, how many of them will there be? Um, and uh, it, we actually put out uh, some good research last month comparing um, other technical uh, booms and, and, and 
how they've ultimately settled into duopoly structures, right? So, so the the most recent and maybe best example, you know, yes, there was uh, the browsers um, where kind of the one, two or, or the dominant browsers, and then there's a pretty steep fall off. Um, but that's also true, um, you know, in, in mobile development, if you think about um, iOS and Android, at the beginning of those kind of tech booms, there was five or six different standards. So right now, I think uh, my operating assumption is that Ethereum and the EVM in particular will be one of those winning standards. And then we'll probably have, you know, one max two uh, other uh, types of, uh, of frameworks that developers and ecosystems rally around, whether that's um, something around Cosmos compatibility or Solana or uh, something else entirely, uh, it, it remains to be seen. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm bullish on uh, Ethereum, layer ones, layer twos, everything in between, because uh, there is a tremendous demand for block space and public ledgers right now that are secured with tokens. Um, as long as that's true, it's uh, it, there's going to be a lot of value that accrues to those systems. For sure. Um, any thoughts on the recent dialogue with Jack Dorsey and Web3 versus VCs? Um, any thoughts on that situation and, and Jack's theory there? Is he is he be becoming a Bitcoin maximalist a little bit? Um, I, I understand uh, both sides here. You know, I uh, I think. If you're uh, if you're Jack and you have lived through Twitter and Square as a founder, and, and you understand the impact that um, regulators and, and nations can have on your business, you're uh, probably naturally going to be uh, attracted to the most decentralized, you know, censorship resistant. Um, uh, alternative and 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 obviously he chose to leave twitter and instead uh, focus full time on square and out block um so my my sense is uh you know a it, it makes sense for him to kind of bang that drum just because i think it's going to be net positive for his new full time focus company um and uh, and two i i just think that maybe he really believes it i don't necessarily agree with them. I think that there's going to be a spectrum um, of solutions and and kind of demand for fully decentralized, quasi-decentralized, you know, smart contract platforms versus currencies. Um, I, I don't think we're living in a, um, a winner-take-all world, but I understand why um, some people are, are so adamant that the most important thing to get right right now is Bitcoin, because we're entering an environment where um, you know, if we have high inflation or, or even a changeover in, in the world reserve currency, that's that's going to be pretty disruptive. And, and so we want to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to to support a, a smooth landing um, versus just kind of dabble with the toys uh, on, on the other hand, which might be his perspective. But um, I think it's it's pretty obvious that we're uh, Web3 is much broader than just Bitcoin. For sure. Um, OK, so let's talk about Ripple and XRP. Um I followed you for years and I've seen your opinion changed a bit uh, at one point about Ripple. Then you spoke to the fo folks who were using uh, X Rapid at the time. Um, but I want to get to date, you know, what's your perspective on Ripple and XRP and what they're trying to build? Um, I, you know, I've written about Ripple in the past, to be honest, I haven't really paid attention to anything they've done in the last couple of years, um, because I think that their their business model with XRP is, um, it, it's just not really interesting. Um, and it, it's, it's going to be tough to um, get other institutions to buy the narrative that they were selling previous, uh, you know, prior to the, the SEC enforcement action against them uh, a, uh, last, last year. Um, I don't really know how to kind of handicap the risk that they have just as a company and, and, and given the lawsuit, but um, I just think it's it's one of the less interesting um, crypto projects uh, out there. You know, much of what they're trying to accomplish can be accomplished um, more efficiently with stable coins and will probably uh, be a priority for any central bank that's trying to roll out a central bank digital currency. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I don't really, uh, I, I've said basically everything that I have to say on XRP and Ripple and, um, 
the, uh, the, the SEC complaints uh, and enforcement action against them, I think, reflected some of the things that I had spoken about previously as concerns. But um, I'm actually rooting for them versus the SEC because I think the SEC is overreaching. Um, and we, we should have clearer guidance on what constitutes security versus, you know, five year after the fact enforcement actions. So let's talk a bit about the SEC. Um, there's just a lot to unpack here. Uh, there's there's talks of conflicts of interest with Jay Clayton, William Hinman, um, not proven, of course, but we're seeing a lot of breadcrumbs. Uh, Genser looks to continue, even not make things worse than Jay Clayton did, uh, not approving a Bitcoin spot ETF, did approve the, the features. And to your point, wants to regulate by enforcement. Um, what are your thoughts on Genser, what he's trying to do, and then also in context of Elad Roisman just stepping down, who is one of the member commissioners who is in line with Commissioner uh, Hester Peirce? Um. So uh, I'm I'm not a fan of the current leadership uh, being you know Chair Gensler uh, because I think he's been you know intentionally misleading and and I've been uh, on on record uh, you know pretty pretty critical uh, about his failure to actually live up to the commission's mandate which is to protect investors ensure fair and efficient markets and, and promote capital formation um, so I think you know they're zero for three when it comes to crypto and he hasn't been helping. Um, you know, uh, I think you can't apply a blanket statement to the entire SEC that uh, the, the commission is is not doing its job or, or, you know, is asleep at the wheel when it comes to crypto, because there are good people like Commissioner Purse and her team that have been much more thoughtful about um, how, how to treat these assets. Um, you know, in, in terms of which way the wind blows this year and, and how some of the new commissioners um, might uh, might bend, one direction or the other. Um, I, I think it's just a, a wait and see uh, approach. The um, Politically speaking, I think it's, it's becoming much more obvious to uh, progressives and, and kind of democratic leading candidates that being on the wrong side of crypto is just going to exacerbate an already uh, significant problem that they have in the midterms. Um, so I, I think we've already seen a, a ratcheting down in, in rhetoric and criticisms, uh, especially some of the baseless attacks. Um, but, you know, how that ultimately uh, translates into you know, regulatory action or inaction, it's, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to say right now. So um, keep it a close eye on it. But um, I think we would much rather engage with the CFTC at this point than the SEC, regardless of who the commissioners are. So do you feel uh, Congress is the body that has to take action here this way they can put the SEC or put the guardrails for the SEC as well as the CFTC and have that balance so it's not Genser going after these uh, different companies and, and projects by regulation by enforcement is it Congress that has to pass the comprehensive crypto regulations uh, well yeah I mean I think that's uh, that is how it's supposed to work, but the reality is Congress doesn't do its job. So I'm, I don't think anyone is, is waiting for that uh, that day that there's actually functioning legislation that's proposed, much less passed, uh, when it comes to, to regulating the crypto industry. So um, we'll see. But uh, I think best case scenario is that uh, we uh, run out the clock until the midterms. And uh, and don't have anything too damaging come out, and then there's there's going to be a number of regulatory and legal challenges uh, related to the infrastructure bill and um, and and any new guidance that might come out from uh, from one of the uh, administration's regulators. So you're not uh, hopeful or optimistic at all by some of the bipartisan support we've seen with, you know, Darren Soto, Ro Khanna, Tom Emmer, Warren Davidson, these guys. Um, I think no, I, I, I think they're all great. I think um, you know Ro Khanna um, and um, and Senator Wyden on the um, on the Democratic side. I mean, there there are a number of thoughtful folks on the left that are, are supporting this. I don't necessarily think that's going to translate into legislation because um, it's very rare that uh, any of these uh, groups actually move quickly uh, when it comes to, um, to to new thoughtful regulation, particularly around tech. And honestly, given the gaps in their understanding and how quickly crypto has been developing, I don't think that's something that we would want anyway. Hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, what that worries me a bit, you know, that we wouldn't get that comprehensive regulations 
Um, and I don't know how long it will take. And it worries me, what is Gary Gensler going to do next? And do we have any, any way to change that? Uh, it, is it just we kind of wait and see who gets sued next? Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I'm, that's elections have consequences. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we are where we are. And, um, you know, I think the good news is that there is pretty uh, sizable grassroots support for crypto and, and a lot of uh, people clamoring for clarity. So um, we're going to get it one way or the other, but um, it's, it's, it's going to play out over the course of the next few years. Uh, and I think right now is trending positive. So I'm, I'm definitely optimistic, but um, I'm pessimistic that you're going to have anything productive coming out of the SEC as long as Gensler's at the helm. Got it. Um, what are your thoughts? I, you know, I, I think this is very interesting. It's related to the SEC lawsuit against Ripple. You have attorney John Deaton filing on behalf of XRP holders. Um, any thoughts on that and that dynamic playing out where, you know, there, there is the, the voices of the smaller people or the, the common man uh, being heard here to a certain degree to participate in this uh, lawsuit. Oh, so which I'm not familiar, which lawsuit in particular? Oh, so the SEC's lawsuit against Ripple, um, attorney John Deaton, um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, he's filing on behalf of about 60,000 plus XRP holders. W what are your thoughts on that? And that the token holders can come together to... Uh, to in some way participate in this. Yeah, honestly, I, I haven't really followed that at all, um, but I wish them luck and I hope they win. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, any thoughts on the, and I don't know if you've been following this at all, but the potential conflicts of interest with Jay Clayton and William Hinman? Uh, you know, I, I think that's an uphill battle. We'll, we'll, we'll see if there's anything that, that comes out of that, but I, uh, I, I'm not sure that I buy that line, uh, but I'm glad that it's being explored and, and aggressively pursued because I think, um, you know, uh, the best defense sometimes is a good offense. Sure. Okay. I want to learn about your plan to run for office. <laughs> Tell us about that. Not, not anytime soon. Uh, having too much fun building a company. So uh, I, I'd said, you know, if I do run for anything, it'd be in 2024 and that's a long time away, but when uh, when I have more to share on that, it'll it'll be uh, it'll be public. Got it, got it. Um, all right, I want to get your thoughts on metaverse. We're seeing a lot of brands jumping in. Everybody's trying to build their metaverse now. You know what? Do, what is your take? Um, uh, I personally think that right now we are in a version 1.0 maybe of the metaverse because a lot of our data is online, person, our profiles, but it's not the VR and augmented reality and things like that fully yet. You know, what do you think? This thing continues to grow. More brands jump on board uh, this year. Um, you know, I think we'll uh, I think we'll definitely see um, more developments in you know the the, the quote unquote metaverse and and particularly with um, with NFTs. I think it opens up uh, a ton of different you know interesting growth avenues for for established tech companies, but. Um, you know, it's going to take 10 years to play out. And I think the limitation is hardware uh, more than anything else, right? There, there, there has not yet been an iPhone for uh, VR. Mm -hmm. The closest is probably, you know, Meta's Quest 2, um, you know, the Oculus Quest. And, um, and I've, I've worn that and I've used that. And, um, and it was an amazing immersive experience. Um, I haven't used it in a year, right? So like, it's one of those things where um, there's a chicken and the egg problem, uh, I think the infrastructure around the metaverse will um, will get built out over the course of the next few years. I think gaming um, and everything that's going on in, in kind of decentralized gaming right now is probably a precursor to a lot of that development. Um, I would expect this to be a, a bigger kind of sustainable trend in, in you know a few years, but um, it's it's certainly uh, going to be pretty frothy. I think uh, as an investment theme for a lot of investors in the next um, couple of quarters. So. Five years from now, you know, what do you predict or see as far as all these things, crypto, NFTs, metaverse, where are we at from an adoption standpoint? Uh, significantly uh, further along than we are today. Um, you know, I, I think the, uh, the, the biggest thing that it, 
is working in crypto's favor is that the um, the population is, you know, every every single successive uh, generation of new users, um, they're uh, they're not going anywhere, right? It's 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 you know, folks in their teens, their twenties, their their thirties, and um, and the folks that tend to be the most critical uh, are those at the the legacy institutions, particularly leadership at, at a lot of legacy, you know, either tech or or finance institutions, and they just gradually start to age out. So um, I think. You know, change is uh, is is going to be largely driven by generational change um, and a rotation in, in leadership of of different companies, um, and just a, a function of time, right? You know, we, we need time to actually build out some of the uh, support structure that's that's going to make this sustainable and 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 safe and secure and, and fix some of the usability problems that we're we're facing today. Mm. Um. CBDCs, central banks around the globe are looking to build their central bank digital currencies, which is the digital fiat version, of course. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Obviously, they're going to be using different blockchains or creating their own. It, and, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, are they allowing crypto to succeed and <laughs> so that we can eventually adopt CBDCs? Uh, you know, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? And could CBDCs be beneficial for the crypto market? Well, I think it's a good question because I think that um, having, uh, you know, if, if the U.S. could dominate this stablecoin market, right, without developing their own uh, CBDC, right, uh, and, and you basically just allow the dollar to be uh, tokenized and, and, and surveilled and properly integrated um, into the financial system, it, uh, it probably puts us in a better position to um, continue to rely on, on the U.S. dollar as a, you know, one of our leading exports. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm cautiously optimistic that um, because we're so far behind uh, China in particular on, on the CBDC front, that there will be more collaboration with, um, with, you know, private players and, um, and we'll, we'll have a little bit more clarity on stable coins in particular this year. Um, hopefully they don't go overboard with the regulations because obviously that can backfire. But um, yeah, well, uh, uh, one of the things that I'm I'm most cautiously optimistic about is um, is you know the U.S. getting its act together, not completely stifling innovation, and instead you know understanding that this is a big opportunity you know both geopolitically and 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 economically for for you know us as a country. Do, do you think some of the stablecoin pushback? is because they're building that digital dollar. Like I've spoken to Chris John Carlo, uh, the digital dollar project, you know, they haven't talked about anything that's come to fruition yet. I think they're still in a dialogue and research phase, but is it, hey, we need to slow these stable coins down because we're coming with the digital dollar and we want that to get adopted versus other stable coins. Honestly, uh, I, I don't know, but, and and the reason I don't know is I don't I don't even think policymakers know. So uh, I, I think they're so far behind, and 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 you know, even uh, getting them to understand that question and the trade offs, um, I, I I still think that they're uh, not far enough along to to make a judgment call one way or the other. Sure, um, you know, one of the things I had discussed with Chris Giancarlo was our constitution. And if the United States was to build the uh, digital dollar, how do they maintain our right to privacy and, and, and all these things? Um, any thoughts on that? Um, Congress has not really gone out of their way to protect civil liberties and, and prioritize privacy over national security uh, for the last 20 years. So I don't really expect that to change. And, and in fact, I think um, when it comes to privacy and, and kind of the right to uh, self custody and 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 transact peer to peer, um, that's going to be one of the things that I think is um, is challenged at the at the courts level and, and probably will even make its way up to the Supreme Court um, in the in the coming years um, because it it seems like uh, there's not going to be a resolution between the security state and um, uh, and and the the crypto state as it were. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to to rights to privacy and and uh, and non disclosure of, of financial assets, mm. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, but I think you're right that uh, given all the things we've seen with the NSA and and all these things, um, 
All right. Uh, real quick question here before we wrap it up. Thoughts on what El Salvador is doing? And could we see other countries adopt Bitcoin as a legal tender this year? Um, and it, it seems like there's dialogue with all other Latin American countries about introducing bills and so forth. What, what do you think happens there? Uh, I would honestly be surprised if we didn't see more countries uh, up on board, particularly if we start to see another trend uh, up uh, towards or, or surpassing previous all-time highs. Um, that could create a lot of momentum. There, there could be you know, a bit of a, a snowball effect. Um, and, uh, and a lot of it has to do with how you know, U.S. Um, economic uh, and, and monetary policy plays out as well. So uh, I, you know, there's a lot of countries in the world. There's a lot of small countries in the world. Um, and in uh, and, and El Salvador, uh, it would be shocking if they were um, the only versus the first uh, to actually adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. But, um, you know, again, how that interplays with CBDCs and, um, and, and you know, which trade-offs uh, different countries make um, will be, uh, it'll be interesting to, uh, to watch for sure. Any thoughts on uh, if any other major tech companies might put Bitcoin in their balance sheet? Obviously, we've seen Tesla, uh, MicroStrategy, seems like Michael Saylor is buying every day, but, uh, you know, the likes of an Apple, Google, Facebook, um, given the inflation that we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be surprised if we didn't. I, I'd say the same, give the same answer as I did with El Salvador. Um, there's a little bit of uh, game theory here where um, the first looks crazy, the second looks uh, like uh, maybe a little less crazy, and then you know the third, the fourth, the fifth start to look like early adopters, um, and then you can you know, have an acceleration of, of adoption at that point once it feels safe, once it looks less crazy, and um, and with you know folks that want to be ahead of the trend so they can capitalize on the upside. All right, so let's hit some wrap-up questions. If you can create your own metaverse, what would it be about? My own metaverse, what would it be about? Uh, I, I don't even know how to, how to answer that. Uh, what, what I did, uh, you know. Would it be like Lord of the Rings or ma- themed or Matrix themed or something? Oh, um, I, would, uh, I would just like to actually be able to get together more frequently with my global friends, right? <laughs> you know, to, to, to be able to like watch a, watch a football game, you know, in, in some like real life hologram type of, uh, of experience, you know, um, where it's, uh, it's a little bit easier to, to get people together versus uh, and a little bit more interactive versus Zoom. But um, we'll, we'll see. I still think that's a, that's a, a long way away. Um, favorite food? Uh I'd say uh, Mar- good Maryland crab cakes. Uh, tough, uh, tough to beat. Favorite musician or band? Uh, I like so much. Uh, I, I have such a wide range of um, of music that I like, um, from you know Rage Against the Machine and ACDC to uh, you know Dave Matthews Band. John Mayer is actually. I would argue one of the best, if not the best blues guitarist on the planet. Yeah. Um, I'm not talking about all of his poppy stuff uh, from, from like his, his early work, but, um, uh, but yeah, his, his, his blues guitarist uh, skills are, 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 I've seen him live and he's incredible. Um, uh, but uh, you know, a- any, anything and everything uh, I'll, I'll dig into. So. I, I play guitar. So I'm a big mayor fan. And to your point, like, I think uh, put the pop stuff aside. He is uh, amazing uh, blues, blues guitar player. Uh, favorite movie? Uh, I'll be boring and I'll say Shawshank. I mean, uh, that's a great movie. Uh, favorite book? Uh, fiction or nonfiction? Uh, I guess fiction. Uh, I really like Stephen King. I think um, I think The Stand is uh, is is one of the uh, uh maybe i don't know if that's my favorite book but it's the one that immediately popped to mind maybe because we're in the middle of COVID, um and it's uh he, he's just such an amazing writer um but uh you know nonfiction. he also is one of the best books on writing uh it's called on writing and um and as a writer i uh i, I recommend that to all of our uh incoming analysts um but uh nonfiction, uh, the, the new Ray Dalio book is something I'd recommend everybody read. 
Oh, that is, I have to get that. Yeah. Um, I saw, I saw his recent interview. Um, so I definitely have to get that book. And when you're not at Masari, what are you doing for fun as a hobby? Uh, I have three kids under the age of five. So that's, that's, that's my social life and my hobby at this point. Well, uh, I, I'm in the same boat, so I certainly understand that. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, best of luck uh, with Masari this year and uh, excited to see the new things that you guys launch and, and the updates and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you.